Philip, an, an economist, and I, a sociologist, have teamed up to organize this conference. The title we have chosen, uh, Entrepreneurship, Risk, Talent, and Innovations, uh, echoes some research interests we share. Most of you are familiar with Philip, Philip's work. For my part, the lecture I've given over the years here at the Collège de France uh, connect more often than not to the issues we will focus on. Valuation of work, multitasking and competition in academia, ubiquity of semantics of talent, the uncertain course of the creative process in the arts, or the controversial issue of merit and meritocracy as a combination of talent, effort, and justice. For those of you who don't know the Collège de France, it was created in 1530 to, to rival the Sorbonne and offer its scholars greater freedom in and for research. It's not a university, since we don't have any students, only PhD students and postdocs belonging to our research teams. The general public can freely attend all of the lectures delivered here, and all of the lectures and conferences are then made available online. The content of what we teach is the product of our ongoing research. We never repeat our courses from one year to the next. This is a bit challenging, I have to say. Uh, the small size of the college, less than 50 professors, and its completely multidisciplinary nature are good levers for encouraging collaboration and exchanges between the professors. And this conference is one such example. Thanks to Philip and to our friendship. Rewarding regarding the program we have set, there, there was just one change. We had invited Professor Alain Fayol, but a few days ago he had to cancel due to serious family issues keeping him away from France. We want to thank warmly all of you for coming uh, and participating. We would also like to thank uh, Patricia Foti uh, for her fantastic job, uh, our sponsors, the Fondation du Collège de France and the LVMH company, um, and of course, the Collège de France itself and its personnel for their invaluable support. So, I guess we have time now to, we, have, we can start maybe uh, ahead of time, it's okay. If you're okay, uh, we will have a bit more room for discussion. And uh, so, uh, each of you speakers uh, could take can take uh, 45 minutes to speak. And uh, feel free to start the discussion between or inside uh, yeah, the, the lecture or the presentation. Uh, I know Philip told me uh, there's a tradition in economics to interrupt people. <laughs> At will, so uh, to yeah. So that's up to you. And uh, in fact, we have 45 minutes. And now I introduce Josh Lerner from Harvard and um, Harvard Business School. And Josh will uh, give us a presentation about great powers and the global landscape of entrepreneurship. Josh, please. Thanks so much for the invitation to come here, and very much looking forward to comments. This is the uh, this is the initial public offering of the paper, so it's got lots of room for improvement. So I'm going to try to talk very quickly to get through the slides to save some time for comments and uh, comments and questions, because uh, I think we're very eager to hear your feedback. Um, so anyway, this is joint work with. Uh, uh, my colleague David Yang and Jacob Moscona from MIT, as well as uh, uh, as well as um, uh, David's uh, doctoral student Zhangzi. Um, okay, so what are we talking about here? Um, what we are doing is look, asking the question of how does the seeming change in terms of the venture capital landscape, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, have an impact on uh, entrepreneurial 
entrepreneurial activity with a particular focus on emerging economies. And in particular, you know, we make the argument that venture investors focus largely on, you know, sort of replicating business models in other places. Historically, uh, U.S. Uh, startups have been the, you know, the sort of guide or benchmark that are there. But with the rise of uh, entrepreneurial activity in China, one seen, uh, uh, one seen substantially more, uh, more entrepreneurial activity there. And the question is, what are the implications of this for uh, emerging markets? And you might say, well, there's lots of interesting things happening in the world, changes in R&D, scientific publications. Why look at venture capital? Well, I think there are really two things that motivate us, first of which is the as we'll show in a minute, uh, the size and magnitude of the shift that's taken place. And secondly, the you know, documented uh, impact that venture capital appears to have, at least in the US context, in terms of you know, development and jobs and innovation and so forth. So what we're gonna do is look at venture deals around the world between, over the last couple decades we're going, to we're going to characterize those firms into essentially 263, uh, 263 subsectors. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that later on. We're going to try to create measures of whether the sectors are suitable for particular countries based on economic and social conditions. And then we're going to also look at the business, mo the business models using the textual description of these businesses and how similar they are to, uh, uh, to, to other firms. And what we're gonna basically find in a nutshell is that when we look at other emerging markets, we do indeed find that they follow the lead of uh, uh, new venture activity in China, that it's largely uh, you know, driven by the factors that have this sort of suitability or share characteristics that are sort of similar to China. Even within the categories, the Firms that are being started in many of these emerging countries, you know, have, you know, emulate the, you know, the actual business models used in China, and it's not so much a phenomenon which is driven by Chinese investors investing in other places. Rather, it's largely driven by the kinds of co companies being created by local investors, but nonetheless are emulating, uh, emulating there. And we argue that this has, you know, some broader implications in terms of capital allocation and the sort of potential mix, which is there. All right, unsurprisingly, this relates to a number of literatures, but we really highlight three clusters of work, you know, very large literature on the international diffusion of technology. There's been a growing body of work on innovation in China per se, and more recently, uh, you know, and then a much more modest work in terms of uh, venture capital and emerging economies. All right, so, just a couple background facts before we get into the empirics. Uh, so this is essentially if we look at you know, the sort of distribution of uh, venture capital worldwide, we go back to 2001, essentially close to 90% of the funding was in the United States and the vast majority of the remainder was in UK, Japan, you know, here, here in Germany. Uh, and then what one sees over the course of the you know, early 2010s is this uh, tremendous acceleration in, um, uh, in Chinese activity, you know, which represents as much as 20, 25% of the world uh, venture investment at, at times, as well as uh, substantial growth in the yellow, which is the other, 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 emerging, other, other emerging economies. Now, it's certainly not the only place that we see changes. So you certainly, if you look at, do a similar graph of R&D and scientific publications. One sees the growth of the yellow and the growth of the red, you know, China and emerging economies as well. But certainly venture stands out in terms of just simply the, you know, the magnitude of the uh, uh, magnitude and the suddenness of the shift that's, uh, that, that, that's there. And, you know, certainly when we look across, uh, you, know, uh, emer you know, recently emerged countries, so here we just simply looked at took a snapshot of what China looked like in 2015, and then looked at a variety of other countries when they hit the 2015, you know, hit the same level, or roughly the same level of GDP per capita that 
China did in 2015, you know, one certainly sees it as a standout along several measures, but certainly, you know, one of the remarkable aspects is just simply how much greater share of the world venture investment they had then relative to, uh, relative to anyone, anywhere, anywhere else. I mean, the one caveat we should probably make is that, you know, when you look at India, though it never re reaches or has not yet reached that threshold in terms of the level, you know, one sees that it looks in a way a lot more China-like than, uh, than, the, than the others. Here's another way to look at it. So we just simply put GDP per capita on the left scale and venture investment on the right scale, right? And you see that in general, China, which is the thick red line, is to the left, which basically means for any given level of GDP per capita over this, over this period, it's had more venture investment than uh, than, than the other countries, with the exception of the green, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is India. The second piece of background is really this observation that, you know, venture capitalists seem to rely very heavily, you know, on emulating business models seen in other co co companies or countries and applying it in these things. And in some sense, that's very understandable. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the process of choosing companies to invest, invest in. You know, but even though there's a lot of work in terms of designing contracts, the contracts can't really solve a lot of the problems. So I just put here a few, you know, a few of a gazillion blog posts about pattern recognition being really important. Here's some quote by uh, Paul Graham founder of Y Combinator saying, I can be tricked by anyone who looks like Mark Zuckerberg, sort of in the same, uh, in the same, uh, in the same, in the same, in the same mode. And certainly this is very true in emerging economies, right? In the sense that you can look at, you know, the, you know, choose your phrase, the eBay of Mexico, the, you know, the Uber of Brazil or whatever, and one sees just, you know, tons of companies sort of styling themselves as basically adopting themselves to this kind of approach. I put a few examples from the ride sharing spaces as an illustration, illustration there. Just again, you know, one last motivation along these lines is, um, you know, we, we think about the category of startups geared towards helping elementary and secondary students, you know, where it was a huge boom in the 2010s in terms of Chinese investment. You know, interestingly, it was sort of followed, and this is a little bit getting at what we're talking about, was followed by a surge of Indian investment, particularly the company Baiju, which got a lot of resources, and where you know many of the Indian investors explicitly said, you know, we looked at China, saw that you know a lot of the features that led to education being really successful as an area were emulated here, and 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 directly directly followed as a, as a result. All right. So what do we actually having done the prelude? Let's talk about what we actually do. Well, we use one of the you know key venture databases, PitchBook, um, you know, and um, you know essentially look from the period of the early 2000s to uh, to uh, to today. Um, you know, we um, you know focus on venture venture deals, and you know this essentially was designed really from its inception as a global database. Uh, you know. One of the issues we grapple with, which is sort of part and parcel of this territory, is the, um, is the fact that you know, the traditional kind of government industry classification schemes don't really work in this kind of setting. In other words, you know, when you think about what venture people are investing in, you know, a lot of the companies will, right in the US context, we have a SIC code 7372, which is software. And you know, a very large number of companies, for instance, fall in that category. But there's, a lot of gradations in terms of different market segments and things that are there. So we use an exercise that PitchBook does where they essentially create, you know, essentially human curated mappings of the business of business segments. And we basically they do it, you know, really for selected companies there. And then what we do is we basically just amp it up, you know, using uh, uh, using machine learning to basically sort the companies which are not mapped into those categories. Obviously, not everyone maps into one of those categories, but it allows us to sort of characterize the landscape in these sort of 
263 large buckets, which are the, 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 the industries that we, we work off of. Uh, let me just say there's a lot of companies running around. Uh, venture capital data is a topic we could talk about for a long time. We won't here, but let's just say there are lots of issues with all these databases and inconsistencies that are there. So we try to do a couple of you know, validation exercises just to make us feel uh, comfortable with this. Let me just sort of illustrate one. One of the things we do is say, you know, China is a particularly tricky place. You know, data availability is complicated. You know, figuring out what really is a company, what is really a venture firm, there's just a lot of big questions there. We sort of line up the pitch book, which is the blue, against a couple of the data sources, which are, you know, they are in terms of the Chinese market, and we feel it's, you know, reasonable. You know, going back to the education example, you know, we sort of can see you know, first, you know, this sort of earlier period in the pitch book data where basically no one's really getting money. Then we see the, you know, the, the Chinese companies and particularly the uh, Yang Fodao and the um, Zui Bang, Zui, the Z thing, uh, you know, basically considerably accelerating in terms of their funding. And then with the uh, Baiju, the Indian company following afterwards. And we look at the, you know, more cumulative, uh, cumulative venture deal volume, we see you know, very much the same kind of uh, three-part uh, three pattern here. So um, what can we say? Well, certainly one thing when we look at the data is that not every sector is VC is, is dominated by Chinese firms. So if you look at the percentage of deals that are Chinese, right? You know, this example of the solutions for primary and secondary students is quite heavy dominance in terms of China of Chinese firms, but others of them have much less, uh, much less uh, presence there. What we focus on is the sectors where either the Chinese activity is above the median or uh, you know, where the majority of the deals done in the sector are, 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 are essentially Chinese, Chinese deals. And we'll use that as a sort of key category to look at. So what are we gonna do? We essentially look at whether um, investments in other places end up following China, and particularly emerging markets, follow whatever these Chinese-led uh, things, things are. We might say, you know, sort of based on the education, uh, education example, that that seemed to be illustrative of what was going on there, but we could also imagine that, you know, China is a bit of a special case in terms of language, regulation, this, that, and the other thing, and so those anecdotes might not be representative. More formally, we're gonna be doing a difference in difference and focus on these China-led sectors after the emergence of the, um, after the emergence of the, um, uh, the Chinese market in the, early 2000, uh, in the early 2010s. And we'll, we'll sort of put in controls for country sector pairs and sector year and country years as part of the analysis. And our hypothesis going in is that we will see that there is essentially this positive influence, uh, you know, positive association between the China-led sectors, you know, post um, post 2012, and particularly for the emerging economies. We'll also do something very similar, which is just a triple diff, where we'll look at the impact of the China-led sectors for the emerging economies and non non-emerging economies. All right. So what do we find? Uh, essentially, when we sort of look at these China-led sectors in post, we see a strong effect for the emerging markets. We see when we look at non-emerging markets, nothing going on. When we do the triple diff, again, we're sort of seeing these sort of strong, uh, uh, you know, strong, uh, strong positive effects where it seems that the, uh, you know, the, glo the growth in China-led sectors is mirrored not just not, it's not just done take place in China, but it's mirrored, uh, mirrored, mirrored more generally. Again, you can look at the pictures. So the on the left hand one, the um, the the red is the you know OECD country, the original OECD countries. The right is the non OECD, and one sees this sort of uh, rapid, uh, rapid, uh, rapid, rapid climb. You might say, oh, this is just deal count. 
maybe the deals that are being done in emerging economies are just rinky-dink little things which aren't, aren't really statistical, you know, significant from a, you know, a dollars and cents kind of perspective. When we do value weighting, we again see this sort of strong, uh, strong, uh, a strong positive effect. All right. So interesting association, but you know, obviously this doesn't uh, doesn't address everything that we might worry about. Now, I will say to our credit, so far we have caught, caught several things in terms of the the fixed effects that are there, right? So. If you think about it, we're controlling for these country year pairs, right? So if you think this is a story that, you know, uh, you know, somehow, you know, Pakistan is just much more sympathetic to China or something along those lines, maybe that, that captures that. Sector year might, you know, sort of deal with, you know, what are some of the topics that are sort of attractive in terms of entrepreneurship. Country sector, again, you know, there might be some sort of specialization taking place. But we try a couple of different other things to try to address the uh, concerns that might be, uh, might be raised. The first of which is trying to sort of create, uh, uh, you know, essentially a, uh, an ex ante, a sort of going in measure of suitability of the um, Chinese technologies for each uh, sector country pair. And in particular, we suspect that we will see more, more, activity, uh, more activity there. And secondly, we're going to try uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, an instrumental variables approach. We don't have a perfect instrument, but our argument is going to be that when you look at the sort of early champions that emerge out of China, part of this may reflect the fact that it's just simply a very suitable area for doing activity, but part of it may just simply reflect the fact that you got, uh, you know, more more randomness, and in particular that you may have had, for instance, you know, Jack Ma may just simply be uh, a great visionary who basically was able to execute on something, and he had Jack Ma decided to go instead to, you know, manufacturing aluminum cans, he would have been uh, a great you know, that would have been a great aluminum can, uh, aluminum can startup. So our notion is going to be saying, you know, if we think that there might be, you know, some degree of semi-randomness in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Chinese firms, that that might be, you know, somewhat independent from the, you know, the, the more, you know, the sort of sector level correlations that are sort of running around. So the first question, as we said, was sort of this notion of suitability, and then going back to that, you know, sort of Indian quote that I sort of threw threw uh, throughout there, you know, that there seems to be this sort of learning that takes place. So we basically try to create a measure from the pre-period of the 2000s of the sort of suitability of uh, Chinese tech in a given sector. We grab the World Bank Development Indicators. We didn't do this at the 263 level, but more created 15 uh, super sectors that we used. And then we basically created this sort of measure of similarity to, to China. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the mechanics of what we, what we do here in terms of the uh, suitability measure. But essentially, it's just taking a bunch of these metrics and trying to create an aggregate score, uh, aggregate score from them. So then our, you know, sort of second equation is again going to have the, you know, the China lead and post, but here we'll put in this measure of suitability of the, you know, of the sector or the super sector for, you know, in other words, to what extent does it share characteristics with, with the, in the given country, does the sector char char share characteristics with, uh, with, 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 with China? Again, we'll put in the country year and sector year and, um, uh, uh, and country sector uh, fixed, fixed effects. And again, we, we expect to see beta greater than zero uh, as, uh, as, our, as our story. And when we run this, run this estimate, we indeed do see this sort of strong impact of the sort of suitability, of this sort of suitability score. Uh, when we sort of just look at the you know, the emerging market, or we, we focusing on the subset of emerging market 
uh, coefficients of sort of triple diff as before, and we basically divide it into those which are in the bottom quartile and the top quartile in suitability. We again see that the previous findings that we had this China-led post-emerging market triple interaction, it really is only being driven by the guys who are in the top quartile of, of, of suitability. You know, still we might worry, right? You know, somehow that there's still hidden stuff that's sort of going on either in terms of the composition of the sectors or the uh, characteristics of the countries, right? We might say we're making a big deal here about, uh, you know, China, you know, China's, you know, you know, Suit, this China suitability score, while this is actually what's really driving it is Indonesia or, or India or some other, some other place. Similarly, we might say this is sort of really being driven by, uh, really being driven by, um, uh, you know, just the mix of the, 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 the sort of relationships at the country level rather than anything at the, at the sector level, that, that somehow our fixed effects are not sort of picking this up. So we try to do a couple of uh, you know, placebo or falsification tests. And in particular, what we do is we, we essentially re-estimate the, um, uh, re the country level analysis. Now we're not looking at suitability relative to China, but suitability relative to the other countries. You know, essentially, we had the coefficient of the 10.6 from before. And what we see is when we throw the other countries in, there's obviously a distribution, but basically you don't see anyone as sort of as, you know, it's convincingly less in other places. Similarly, we do a process of saying, let's do randomization within the sectors of, of a country. So if it's just a Pakistan story, it's not going to matter whether it's, you know, B2B software or e-commerce or something like that. So we do a randomization there. And again, we sort of see that, you know, there seems to be something different with the, you know, that, that the placebo values are the, you know, the falsification values are substantially lower than what we see when we see when we use the, you know, the, 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 right, the right measures. Do, do we have a sense, I mean, how much is driven by real factors like the production chain, uh, the value chain, right. you know, uh, versus, right. uh, versus also the finance part? Right. No, I think it's it's a great question, and you know, in a way, this is sort of where we're where we're going is sort of a, the real effects kind of questions here, right? Is to say how much of this is you know essentially going to have you know ultimate consequences yeah. on the on the firms that are here. Now, I'll I'll I'll, I'll save a couple minutes at the end just to complain about how hard it is, and maybe you guys will have some brilliant ideas of where to go. So let me just defer that for three minutes, if that's, if that's OK. Um, you know, as I said, one of the things that we also do is, you know, so far we've really been looking at the mix of the, you know, which of the 263 sectors things are in, and how that either does or does not reflect that in other countries. We also look within the categories. So essentially, we, because you know, PitchBook is kind enough to sort of put a little textual, you know, 50, 50, 75 words, 100 words of text, we're basically throw those against the, you know, the Chinese and other companies and try to look at the, uh, look at the similarities in terms of the text. And again, we sort of see that, you know, in the places which have uh, China-led sectors after 2012 and with a sort of high suitability score, the language mirrors more closely, even, you know, even within the category, the specific words being used in the descriptors of the of the uh, of the uh, of the Chinese uh, of the Chinese businesses, and finally, as I said, we sort of you know if if you accept the proposition that there is some degree of randomness in the you know sort of emergence of unicorns, you know, certainly when we do the first stage of saying if you get an early unicorn, is the sector likely to be China-led? Yes, I, and then we basically just use those as instruments and continue to get uh, strong effects there. We spend a tiny bit on mechanisms and particularly asking, you know, is this being driven by, you know, people giving more money to existing companies or, you know, starting more, more companies? The answer seems to be a little bit of both, but, you know, with the strongest effect being on 
starting, starting new companies. The other thing that we did in terms of mechanisms is ask the question of saying, is this really a story about you know, Chinese investors coming in with big, big pocketbooks and putting money to, money to work? And when we try to do that kind of exercise, what we see is that there is a little bit of everything, but you know, certainly the strongest effect really is for the, the Indian investors investing in Indian education companies and the, and the, uh, and the, and the like. All right, so to Philippe's question, this is really where we're going, is to say, where, where, what, what can we see in terms of consequences here? The main thing which is, you know, so what can we look at? What, what can we look at? Well, clearly one thing we can look at is, you know, the success of companies themselves in terms of saying, you know, who becomes a unicorn, who raises significant amounts of venture financing, who goes public or gets acquired and stuff like that. So that's, in some sense, easy to do. A lot of that data is already lurking in the pitch book universe, which makes it easy. A second thing we can do fairly straightforwardly is look at, is look at innovation and particularly looking at patents. And there, you know, the beauty of patents is you've got a lot of text. We've already done a lot of the NLP stuff in terms of figuring out there are 263 words, what the key bigrams and other phraseology is. So we can just simply throw it against this and end up saying, do you see more patenting of Indian firms in the treated, in the treated sectors and, 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 and so forth? What's harder is what we would really like to go is really more the um, uh, is really more towards what I think Philippe is pushing, which is more the, the real real effects, which is things like jobs, right? And you know here what we sort of struggle with is right you can go to ILO or OECD website and look for nice tabulations of jobs by country by by year, right? And you can certainly <coughs> see a lot of stuff at the one digit level, right? But when you think about where we are, right, we're saying there are 50 subclasses of computer software, right? That's where the real rub is to sort of be able to do that at the sort of super detailed level. Um, you know, as some of you know, um, uh, uh, Nick Bloom and Tarkasan and I have been doing some stuff, you know, trying to take burning glass and sort of using it against bigrams associated with innovation. I think. Burning Glass is now up to like uh, 28 countries or so. Unsurprisingly, not a lot of emerging economies. And they also have this rude feature that, you know, French job announcements are just not in English for some reason. And that makes uh, the playing the bigram game obviously a much more difficult as a result. So this remains an area that we're, we're, we're thinking hard about in terms of saying, what other metrics can we come to that can sort of get closer to what Philippe wants, but you know, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, have uh, you know, get be able to do at the level of granularity of the sort of super fine, uh, super fine sectors that we're looking at. The question that I have to you, the view we have sometimes is that venture capital is very much more innovative frontier right. stuff bank finance for maybe less frontier and, yeah. and uh, do you find in what you do any, anything like that that if you you know if you if right. it's kind of innovative stuff done elsewhere you know that would build on China whatever then local venture capital plays a role but if it's more like uh, you know uh, more incremental stuff or more uh, less frontier stuff elsewhere there, uh, maybe venture capital locally is less important. Do you, do you have this? You, right. you, you insist on the distinction between emerging countries yeah. and not emerging, but you could, right. you could reason in terms of uh, how across, across, across and, uh, the sectors well, or the nature of the finance. That's right. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting set of things we can certainly think about yeah. as well. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if there's going to be a ring road of broken trade. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Those are kind of like mimicking China and those are right. not mimicking China. Right. To see the extent to which when you have kind of more of a indigenous path to venture capital, right. that results in more or less jobs. And here you right. can just do it at a national level as opposed to the second right. level. 
Right. So somehow we're saying controlling, for, I mean, right, you'd say Pakistan and India, right? If you've got much higher emulation in Pakistan than you do in India, you say control for all this macro stuff you want, but then say, do you end up seeing more evidence of entrepreneurial success in India than in Pakistan or vice versa, right? Yeah. All right. Um, it's a great idea, and I think we could certainly do some sort of, you know, say, you know just helicopter up and say, let's now leave the 263 micro level aside and really think about just some of the broader, uh, the broader patterns that are, that are here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the same kind of thing is it's really, what's the mechanism? Is it a real thing or is it perhaps just the, you know, seeing what other China is doing? Maybe, you know, there's all these other measures of closeness mm -hmm. between right. China and many other countries, right. the trade flows, right. the API flows, right. idea flows through citations. Maybe <coughs> using all those mechanisms, could you say that, you know, whether those closeness measures, mm -hmm. you know, gravity type of things, are right. kind of picking up right. what you're seeing, that's hard because you can't get the granularity, right. maybe you have to be a coarser right. than that, but that would at least right. dig into a bit, you know, right. is there any, kind of, is, is it really to do with, say, China investing or already? Right, exactly. Countries? And if nothing else, it would be sort of, I mean, a, a validation measure that what we're picking up is something real if it's sort of associated with you know, various kinds of economic ties. Yeah. So I think that's a very, really interesting idea. I, the last thing I will point out is that, you know, in, in some sense, you know, you know, we have, you know, in a way, we've tried a variety of things to try to get at, um, you know, get at, uh, you know, association versus causation, and we will continue to sort of push in this level. It's probably going to be, you know, continue to be imperfect, but we do have one, you know, bright spot on the horizon, which is uh, the Chinese government in its own right. And in particular, the, within the last 18 months, the Chinese government has made a couple of uh, reforms to their venture industry that, you know, violate all of Josh's rules about what to do. And in particular, you know, this sort of huge influx of public funding and also a very strong push. And this is Neil Shen who ran what was called until last week, uh, Sequoia China's phrase, politically correct venture capital, which means to say, you know, no internet, no easy money, but focus on, you know, sort of deep problems like advanced materials and other things that are presumably directly useful to the government. Uh, and you can imagine that this has, uh, you know, would have a big impact in terms of the, uh, you know, what's being done in China, but also perhaps potentially on the, you know, the the usefulness of the uh, uh, the usefulness of you know Chinese venture as a model for emerging economies, and you know, obviously, really understanding what the consequences of this are is something that's you know quite a few years <coughs> out, but it seems to have a very nice flavor of being a real discontinuity that will be uh, will be exploitable, particularly if the Chinese sort of stick to their um, uh, uh, stick to their you know what the economist calls their not necessarily for the better uh, policy shifts. Yeah. Uh, so maybe related to your policy question, so I feel like I read earlier this year that China was introducing almost like a traffic light system for public listing of companies by right. sectors. So uh, certain sectors are right. listed and they can no longer uh, access kind of IPOs. Right. Some are yellow, some are green. Is that, uh, to what extent do those kinds of policy shifts also translate to this kind of VC environment? Yeah. Could that maybe be a source of some potentially exogenous variation? Yeah. Yeah, so it, I mean, what seems clear is that the, you know, if you look for most of the decade of the 2010s, you know, it was, you know, the policy there was very much, uh, you know, we want to encourage venture activity, but within venture activity, it was very laissez-faire, right? That, you know, there was a sense of just saying, this stuff is good for the economy, and we want to, we want to promote it, and, you know, you would, you would have competitions between, um, you know, Ken Jen and, Shanghai in terms of saying we want to be a venture hub and so forth, but very little in terms of uh, very little in terms of the intervention in terms of what kind of sectors or activity was kind of preferred. And then really growing out of the you know sort of pandemic and post-pandemic period, one seeing this sort of much heavier hand of the government in terms of steering the uh, steering the venture sector there. 
you know, presumably, you know, just to things that they feel are, you know, directly useful for the, for the, um, for the, Ch for the Chinese government or state or whatever kind of word you want to use. Uh, but, uh, and that really, and I think that as you say, you know, one manifestation has been, you know, one of the choke points they really have is the sort of, you know, ability to control the listing, listing requirements and what, what can list and what, what can't. The other is, you know, clearly just you know, as government money is flooded in, they've definitely been a, you know, a sort of strong sector bias. And finally, you know, there's also just simply a sense, you know, among uh, many groups, and, you know, the, the interview with, uh, that Shen did with the FTs, remarkably candid there in terms of really saying, you know, I don't want to be investing in places that, you know, the Chinese government feels is uncomfortable or doesn't want to, doesn't want to encourage. Yeah, you mentioned the education sector. This is an yeah. interesting case, in right. fact, because uh, right. there was a kind of political turn uh, right. recently. Right, exactly. Uh, so what is good for the economy maybe is not that good for the society. And right. uh, that's the way right. where uh, maybe Xi Jinping Trying right. to oppose the expansion and the right. exponential growth of private <coughs> education, right. and education because right. it's uh, yeah. polarizing the society. Right. And, and I think you'd say that, you know, similar, I mean, a lot of motivation seems to be very similar in terms of the crackdown on, <coughs> you know, social media and other kinds of internet investing, right? That yeah. there was sort of a sense that, you know, I think as we all see, social media has broad implications for society, not all good, and that they, you know, definitely, you know, again, put that on the, uh, you know, on that sort of bad list in terms of areas. Can, can you explore, you know, for example, we know we've been a kind of crackdown on Jack Ma, you know, yeah. there's been recently some kind of, uh, yeah. you know, uh, anti-liberalization uh, measures yeah. in China. Can you explore, do you think you could explore this kind of political, uh, yeah, economy, but political shocks to, to you know, into your what you do. See yeah. whether it affects the diffusion or whether right. it, uh, yeah, that's I mean, something that you could. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we can. It may be more a 2027 paper than a yeah. 2023 <laughs> so, paper. Yeah. Uh, yeah, by which point yeah, this, it was this line too is, long to be to be right. Exactly. So it will take some time to sort of really, uh, you know, sort of manifest itself, but. <laughs> You know, I just, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, again, you know, I think the one thing that's clear is that, uh, you know, there's a million and one interesting things here, and, you know, certainly relative to the, you know, 120,000 papers on the U.S. venture industry, you know, I think it's fair to say that this is sort of an understudied, uh, understudied topic. Thank you. Right, thank you.